Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, silence. Hey, how are we doing? How's ChefConf so far? I think it's awesome. It's always awesome. I, I beg people to come here, and every year it's, it's just close, but I managed to get you know, work's budget done, and I get here, and I love it every time. Um, and so welcome to day two, and hopefully you're not all in a food coma after lunch. I kept it light, so I wasn't sleeping through my own talk. Um, what I'm here to talk to you today about is real-world habitat plans and kind of the journey I went through and the journey you will likely go through when you're building plans. So um, let's start here. Uh, so my name is Graham. Um, embarrassingly, my face has been up a couple of times in the keynotes, uh, so you may or may not recognize my face. Um, I work for the cloud platform department in Racton, uh, previously the operations department. Um, just for my knowledge, who knows who Racton is? Oh, wow, that's so much better than last year. Um, I think it's a lot of our sports sponsorship that we've been doing. We've been getting a little bit more exposure uh, across the world, and we're starting to grow our services. I think most of the Americans in the room probably know us through Ebates um, and other services like Kobo and a few other bits and pieces. Um, but we're fairly big presence in Japan. We have things like the mobile network operator. We have, um, so we're competing with Docomo and things like that. We have a mall that competes with uh, companies like Amazon. Um, we have all kinds of things. We used to have a wedding service, but I've been told that's being shut down. Um, all kinds of stuff. We have you covered from birth to death, they say. <laughs> so, new conference, who dis? Um, I've been doing DevOpsy things, and I hate saying that, but DevOpsy things for about seven years. Um, prior to that was sort of traditional server administration, and um, before Chef was around, I'd built my own tooling uh, in Python. Um, so yeah, server administration for about 12 years or so, and uh, I used to be a um, fairly big PHP open source contributor um, to a particular framework, Cake PHP. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, but uh, that's where I used to be, and that's where my, oh, there's a hand at the back. I'll, I'll buy you a beer later, um, and I'll apologize for all of the code. Um, most recently, uh, you may or may not know, I've gone mad for Habitat. Um, all of my work is uh, pushed towards that. All of my spare time is pushed towards that. And um, the reason for it is I do think it's the future of, of packaging software and releasing software. Um, in the last, um, what is it, six to nine months or so, I've been doing a lot of core plans contributions. And um, that's, that's for a number of different reasons. Um, not only do I want to support the community, but I really want to learn myself. And as someone that's done things like Linux from scratch for, just for playing around and doing like uh, the old um, stage zero Gentoo, uh, Gentoo builds and stuff like that, I wanted to learn more about the low level software, what it was doing, why I needed it. Like, have you ever looked at a package as a requirement and like, I don't know what that is, but I need it, the, the, the documentation says I need it. I wanna know what all of that is. Uh, and this gives you the capability to, and, and if you jump in and have a look at the core plans, you can see how that software is built, the right way to build it for portability. Uh, it's a great way to learn. So the transition to Habitat for Racton, for, for my company, is a difficult one, and uh, you'll often see me talking to people about Habitat. I had a gentleman talking to me just before the talk here, and selling Habitat is hard, so I wanna take you through a bit of a day in the life of me at work trying to sell Habitat. And it looks almost exactly like this. <laughs> <clears throat> There's so many features in and around Habitat and uh, I think to sell someone on it and to get into the basic usage of it, you need to focus on one thing. Um, but I'll get so excited in talking to someone, I start talking about you know, channels, automatic updates, and then it goes on and on and you know, I become the, the Habitat guy. So when it comes to using Habitat and integrating it into your existing systems, I'm gonna talk about a few of these features and why you wanna use it, but I wanna talk about separation to begin with. So you need to separate your concerns in your stack. If you're familiar with Chef, and I think most people here are probably already familiar with Chef and probably already have a Chef stack out there, try not to use, sorry, Chef Infra for everything. Right? Try not to use it for everything. Define the lines of where the responsibility lies on certain things. 
Does anyone know what this is? Don't tell me what it is. Sorry? Yeah. What if I zoom in a bit? Do I get some more hands? Do you know what this is? Put your hand up if you know what it is. Okay, we'll go in a little bit closer. These are cookbooks and the dependency graph for the cookbooks for one application. Right, this is, uh, if I rewind three years, this is, uh, so I'm a big advocate of the Berkshelf approach. Um, never used uh, profiles and stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. At the very top there, you'll see the application itself and then another dependency below. It's, it's kind of hard to see. But this is a super complicated setup, and this is fully done with Chef. It's, it's the whole application release, it's the whole operating system, everything we need done with Chef. It's manageable, but it takes, like onboarding someone to learn this and, and maintain this takes a long, long, long time. And it turns out it's no longer necessary. We don't need to do it in this way, and there are much better ways to manage uh, software releases with Habitat. And we're starting to see that with Chef releasing software and deploying it with Habitat. So I've been able to reduce this quite dramatically. So drawing the line, the first thing you want to do is get your compute ready. If it's, a, if it's containers, that's another story. Uh, but I work traditionally with uh, VMs and bare metal. And we do a, a bit of container work and we're moving more into that and getting people migrated. But some of the basics you need is you should be able to log into your server. Your provisioning stops there. Once you can log in, you can then start using the next tool. Keep using Chef. I will, never sell, I will never tell someone to not use Chef. It's still extremely important for all of your workflow. But conf configure the common services or configuration that you need just to get something running. So this is outside of the, the scope of an application. You want to do things like uh, central authentication. Right? So if you've got some authentication system for your servers, just set that up. Um, any networking you need to do, uh, if you've got to set up uh, any particular routing rules or any of that stuff that doesn't necessarily bind directly to the application, do that. Any common server log shipping, any of that stuff. And of course, you want a Habitat supervisor. And that's my standard now. Just set up the basics of common logging, authentication, networking. There's a little bit of disk partitioning. And then the Habitat supervisor, and I'm done. That is Chef's responsibility. Click. Next piece on from there, and it's a big piece, this, is, this diagram is not to scale, um, is the application binaries, the application configuration, all of their contracts. And this is the biggest piece. Um, what I think Habitat has done for application developers, and maybe not necessarily for infrastructure engineers and developers, is made, us, made application developers responsible for their full software stack. It's no longer placing a piece on the top of the stack and just hoping it doesn't fall off. Right. So this is what I've been calling internally is the happy stack. And it's great. It, it's, it makes it much, much simpler uh, and easier to operate. There's, there's one other piece that um, you could do. Maybe you could also do some compliance checking if you're into that sort of thing. Um, I don't do a lot of it, but uh, I do suggest that people may want to look into it. So the, the, I'm going through a little bit of basics here and a little bit of sales pitch, so I'm, I'm sorry for that, but we'll get into the, the real world examples really, really soon. Um, there's the formal side of why Habitat, and I think it's an, a bit of an overload. Um, you've seen, you've probably seen the simple build process. Actually, before I go too far down the list, who has used Habitat in some way, shape, or form? That's about 50%. Who wants to but hasn't yet? Oh, hopefully that's the other 50%, it looks like it. So there's, there's a few things that it really does for, for us. It's a simple build process. Um, when you look into complex software and the build pipelines that go in and around it, I strongly believe that I can replace most of those with a small bash script. I mean, that's a joke from a long time back, right? Most of the people in the room could be replaced by a small bash script. Um, Habitat's actually done it. Um, the network aware supervisor, uh, one of the things that I learned a long time ago is never write your own supervisor. That's a bad idea. Um, Habitat went and did it, but they've made it network aware to, 
to begin with. So our traditional stacks are deploying supervisors and then applications on top. And then one of the last things that we'll do is let's install some more software to think about how we make this aware that it's part of a cluster. Right? We'll install something like um, console is a good example for service discovery. Right? It's an extra piece of software that needs additional configuration to be made aware of this across the network. But a network aware supervisor that can form the ring like Habitat does has service discovery built in. It knows what's running on it because it runs it. And I think that's one of the most amazing um, innovations uh, in Habitat. The automatic builds, I, I'm leveraging automatic builds and I'll talk more about that later in a way that means I've got a zero touch and almost zero, uh, zero pipelines, but still automatic builds and deploys. Uh, the guaranteed dependencies come along with it. So when you build your application, dependencies are, are packed in with your application. They're guaranteed to be a certain, uh, certain version of certain libraries that you need. And the multiple export formats is something. So it, internally, I don't know how your companies are going, but if you're moving towards containers, I'm super concerned about Rakuten's vision. We're using Kubernetes, we're planning, and we're moving towards it. And everyone's super excited by it, but I, I feel like they're standing in front of like a wall and they can't see beyond it. Like when, when VMs became possible and simple and easy to deploy, was that gonna be the end of technology? That was the end solution? There's nothing else gonna be better than this? And I worry that no one else can see that Kubernetes is great now, but what are we doing in and around our software, which runs the business, to plan for that next big thing that's better than Kubernetes? Because there will be something. Right? The multiple export formats covers that uh, to a certain extent and allows us to build new exporters as the new thing comes along. Right? So we, we're separating ourselves from those deployment types and freeing ourselves up, uh, making ourselves able to move from one platform to another. Um, the automated update, again, is something I'm going to touch uh, a little bit later, but uh, having a supervisor that's network aware that can also say, there's a new package, I'm going to automatically roll that out based on whatever strategy you've said. And the other thing is, and why I stick around here, is the great community. Um, it, it's really a supportive community. We've got a great uh, uh, Slack channel with really, really helpful, supportive people, uh, core maintainers um, for the, the Rust side of things and for the core plan side of things. They're all in there. And I kind of just talked about that. OK, so this is how I'm seeing software pack packaging through the ages. I've put eBuild on that end, and the Gen 2 users can come and argue with me later. Um, but tarballs is where it started, and then we started to get operating system specific. And now I see us moving to what I really believe is the future of software packaging, is operating system independent. And there's actually a lot of systems coming out now that do a similar thing, but doesn't have as good an ecosystem around the packages. Um, to separate yourself from the operating system is a, it's a liberating thing. It's a, a truly amazing thing for any software uh, developer to be able to do. So when I'm talking to people about Habitat, so I try and stop looking like the crazy man just saying Habitat all over the, t all over the place, is try and bring it down to a few simple features that people really need that are gonna change their business or change the way that they develop. Flexible deployment is the one that I'm trying to hit at the moment, particularly as we go through transitions from bare metal to containers or from VMs to bare metal. Um, so that's our story. We're transitioning off VMs to go to bare metal or containers. Pick one. But pretty much everyone's on VMs. So this provides us a way to give them flexible deployment. You can continue doing your VM deployment for now, but in two years when you have to absolutely stop those VMs, your build process under Habitat allows you that flexible uh, deployment, that freedom of deployment. Um, CD without CD. And this is something uh, people can argue with me. Please argue with me. CD is super important. CICD, uh, I, I'm not sure exactly where it falls, but we're kind of doing CD without a CD pipeline, which is great. And I'll show an example later where we have basically uh, Habitat building the packages and the supervisor updating automatically. We don't need Jenkins or uh, we have a little bit of Circle CI stuff going through. Racton, but I don't need those pipelines. They're not necessary. And the other important thing, and I think this comes back to operations, is to know the stack. 
when software is being deployed, you know exactly what it's running on. So from the developer side, you're guaranteed to have exactly what you need. From the operations side, we can assess uh, and, and curate that, um, those underlying uh, software pieces. So I think everyone's story as you go through Habitat starts off with something like what I did. And this is, this is still running on a server somewhere and being used uh, in the company. Um, I started out with Minio, and for a couple of reasons. And number one was it was a very good example in the Habitat plans. Um, but I started with directly running a core plan. I inject the config, I, update, I upload SSL certificates. And w my objective here was to do a system that uh, so as we move to containers, we're not going to be allowed to mount NFS file systems. So how do I get access to it? Put Minio in front of it, mount an NFS on the back of, of Minio, and provide an object storage interface to the NFS. It's kind of a bit of a hack, but it allows me to get object storage into containers with a, a sneaky NFS on the back end. Um, but the plan looks a bit like this, without my custom fancy fonts. Um, I'm running the core plan for Minio, and I inject my SSL certs and a tiny bit of custom config. And on the back end of that server, I'm mounting NFS. Very, very simple. And that's a good first step into plan development and plan usage, well, plan usage in this case, of just running a core plan to see how it works. You get exposure to the supervisor. It's, uh, you can do it in a safe environment on your laptop. Uh, do it in the studio, a throwaway environment. Uh, but this was my first deployment. And I went on from there as I started to get more and more involved with it uh, to go onto my personal websites. Um, you know, my, my blog and I've got a few other gaming sites and things. Um, so what I did here was to make a, an example for habitat usage and deployment was this is all open source and the, the, link, is, the link is here on GitHub. Um, you can see all of the plans, all of the code for the sites. You can see uh, all the pieces that make this go together. And it's a slightly non-standard setup. I've got Caddy, which is the web server I'm using. And the reason I use that is uh, it's fast. It's HTTP2 ready, uh, automatic SSL updates. And I like shiny new things. <laughs> I use Hugo um, just because I like the idea of static sites. Right? So it's a static site generator. Um, like I said, I do the SSL update, so um, I use Let's Encrypt. Uh, on the side, I'm also doing an RTMP service for uh, live streaming. I do a lot of game development, and I live stream my game development. But I want control over my streaming, so I've built an RTMP server built on Nginx. And the whole thing goes through automatic updates. So all of my supervisors are listening to a stable channel. And as soon as a new package is available, it rolls them out. So the structure looks a little bit like this. Sorry for the presentation. The, the fonts are off. Um, what you're looking at there is I'm using the Caddy core plans for the load balancer at the top and my site on the left. I'm encapsulating those in what's called a configuration plan. It's kind of like a, a wrapper cookbook was in, in, uh, in the Berkshelf way. Um, what this allows me to do is to wrap my configuration around an existing binary and not worry about the build of the software. So I don't have to build Caddy. I can rely on the core plans. Now, the other approach that I've got here for the RTMP stuff is it's an Nginx server, but it needs custom uh, extensions built into it. I can't use the core plan because I need to compile it. I need to compile in additional software. So I use an approach here, which is basically forking the Nginx plan and adding in my extra code. So I take a copy of it which I don't see a lot of people doing, but I encourage people to do. Not everyone's going to want to run exactly the Nginx version that Core Plans provides. But what it does provide is the exact code that you need to compile a successful and stable Nginx. Take that, copy it, modify it as you need. The next example that I've got is a little bit special. Uh, and this is what I'm working on right at the moment, and proof of concept is done, and we're, we're just waiting for the schedule to roll this out. Um, and this is, um, this is an actual work project. So we're using Nginx in 
open resty it's it's the most boring project in the world we have a bunch of sites right we're, we're a very big uh, online retailer we have all these physical load balances and we have all of these backends serving up traffic when the backends become too busy we offload that traffic onto what we call the sorry service to say i'm sorry we're too busy at the moment which shouldn't happen often, and it should only happen really if there's a problem with those back-end web servers, not necessarily load. But uh, my job was to make the sorry servers more efficient. We have, uh, I think it's in the range of uh, 300 or something, 400 of these sorry servers. It's a lot of static web servers, right? But they're, just, they're built in such a way that uh, they needed to be separated amongst the physical load balances. It's a very, very boring project, so I made it interesting. I've made it auto-update, and um, we'll go through the, the bits and pieces. So at build time, I do host configuration. So each of the VIPs that are coming into our service uh, are configured. You can add via an API call. Uh, it might be uh, checkout.rakuten.com. We add that VIP and assign it some certain content. When the Habitat package is built, it takes that host name and builds out the Nginx configuration for that specific host. So we have build time configuration for it. So that artifact, when it's ready to go, it's ready to go with all the config you specified. We've also built this API that results in package rebuilds. And most of that magic is not a uh, script that I've written. It's just the way the system operates with uh, on-premise builder and some, some trickery around running the workers for builder. So our API, what it does is it actually makes a commit to the repository that these plans exist in. When that commit happens, a hook is fired and builder is notified. It starts rebuilding the package. When the package is rebuilt, the supervisor underlying it updates the package. So with an API that's maybe called 10 or 15 times a day, when someone finishes calling this API, the end result is the new version has been published on the server, on the staging server, which is an ideal result, I think. So production release from there is one click. There's a bit of testing that needs to go in and around that, but to release to production is, at the moment, just a builder uh, channel production, uh, channel promotion. So it looks a little bit like this. We've got HA proxy on the front end. We use the core plans directly. Um, one of the reasons why you'll see me on core plans updating specific ones like HA proxy and Nginx as soon as releases come out is because I'm using them in my work. I need them up to date. Um, but we wrap HA proxy with our uh, load balancer balancer. And we have a website on the back end with Nginx, and we have the API with Nginx. It's a very, very simple setup. Um, the hook side of things and the commit side of things is the API directly does that git commit to the web project, and then Builder picks that up and releases a new one. So it's a very, very simple project, but a really good approach to taking these core plans, extending them, using them, wrapping the configuration in a real world project, something that's being relied on for a global business for their front end load balances, and making it super simple and fun to deploy. OK. I've got a couple of examples that I want to go through. Um, and they start off very basic. Um, they go through a bit of my history of how I got onto plans and uh, how I use them, and then they go onto more complex examples. Um, so I want to introduce, this is a couple of things I want to do here. I want to introduce you to Caddy. If you've not heard of it, super, super cool web server. Um, some of the simplest configuration I've seen anywhere. Has, has anyone used Caddy? A couple of people? I see three. Cool. Um, yeah, super cool and super fast, um, but we'll go through an example of uh, exactly how to do it. Just give me one second to get in the correct directory.
You guys see that at the back okay? Cool, thumbs up everywhere. I've got a cheat sheet on my screen, so hopefully this goes exactly as it's supposed to. So your first exposure, I think, uh, as you go through the learn approach on, on, uh, on the Habitat website, is to uh, deploy, I think it's a Node.js application that they get you to deploy, as an example. Um, there's certain reasons why I don't like that particular example. Like, uh, it has its own package manager, right? So you've got NPM on the background. If you're doing some Ruby stuff, you've got Bundler to deal with. There's lots of reasons why that's a complicated story and why I won't want to touch that just now, but I can talk to people about that later. Uh, the Python story is another interesting one. Um, but what you're gonna do to initially begin, um, and for those of you that have tried it, this might be old news, so um, we're gonna start a new plan, have plan, and yet we'll call it caddy server, and it generates some code for me. So I'll go into that directory bunch of files. Um, if you haven't seen a plan before, let's see if I can remember this. This is our plan sh file. So it's generated for the name that I've got. My origin is rack ops, racked in operations, um, basic placeholders, and um, so we scroll down. There's a lot of commented out stuff that you may or may not need. What we want to do to start with, my first example would be to take caddy and actually get the binary and deploy it ourselves. We're not gonna use the core plans. So hopefully you can see, I'm a nano user, so you guys can roast me about that later. Oh, we've got a nano user out the back. Nice. Not alone. So, let's wait for the giggling to die down. Um, so, very, very simple. What we're going to do here is make a few changes. Can you see the cursor? I'm not sure. Yeah. I actually can't see it down here, so it's super confusing. Um, right. So what we want to do is, um, well, step one, how do we get caddy? And I'm hoping I can drag this over to the... That's not quite it. Yes, live code demo with internet required. All right, so we go to Caddy. Now, the thing about Caddy is if you build it from source, uh, it's under an open license. If you use one of their binaries, you can use it for demonstration purposes, so I'm covered, um, or for personal use. Right? So if you want to use it for business, you need, to, um, you need to build it yourself. Or you could use the Habitat build. Right? We've already built it for you. Um, so I'm doing this the slow way because this is exactly the way that I did it originally, right? So I want a Linux 64-bit uh, build. I don't want any plugins. I want telemetry off um, plan. I want the free version. And then there's a download button here, which I'm not going to click just yet. Because finding these links is super annoying. Um, where is... Copy link address right there. All right, so that's the download link. So I'm going to come back across to the window here and say the package source is that. That URL. Very, very simple. Now, Habitat does a few things around assuming uh, defaults for software. So if, if we were downloading Nginx, for example, I would call the plan nginx. It would do things like when I'm downloading the file, the file name should be nginx, whatever the version is. Uh, so it does some weird things with uh, the file name here, but it should be straightforward as, uh, as you'll see. So caddy distributes a single binary. It's built with Go, so it's very convenient for us. So what we need to do is uncomment this bin directory. That's where we're going to put our binary that we're going to run. This makes it available on paths that will use this plan as well. It'll make the binary available. Um, next piece I need is package service run. Now this takes place of a hook, a run hook. Um, if you don't know what a run hook is, uh, for a service package uh, or a service plan, there's a directory here. Um, 
I'll quickly jump out and show you. There's a hooks directory here that can contain a run hook, and it contains the instructions and code you need to run your service. In place of that, you can have this package service run, which is basically if you've got a one-liner to run your thing, which we do here, you can put it there instead. So all we need to do is run caddy, specify the configuration file, which is going to be in our service config path. Caddy file. I'll just go down and check what we've got for users description. OK. So I want to take you through the exact process, right? So the next thing you do once you've written your plan is enter the studio. Now, the Habitat Studio, for those that don't know, um, it's a Docker container, a clean room environment so that you can build things and um, reliably rebuild. All we need to do is type build. It's using that plan sh file to download some stuff and gives me an error, right? The reason for the error is I didn't tell it the SHA sum to verify the downloaded file. So I'm going to exit my studio. Where's my SHA sum? It's important to show these errors. I see these every day. Um, so we'll build again, and we'll get more errors, but I'll show you why. So it's downloading again, because it couldn't verify the, the SHA sum. Unknown archive format. That one didn't come up in my practice run. So what we're going to do here is this package file name, we're going to specify exactly this is what you're going to have for the file name. It's looking at the, the extension. And because it's got part of the URL in that, I think that's, that's the problem. So now it's downloading to caddy server 0, 0, 1, uh, 0, 1, 0. Um, Now it's got an error saying it's trying to build, but there's no configure. It's, it's a Go binary. It doesn't have a configure. So Habitat is assuming you're building a piece of software, probably going to have configure. You're probably going to have a make file. But we don't have any of that. So what we do is actually make the build process a little bit simpler. And right down the bottom here, We're going to override the build process. And just return 0, which is to say the build process was successful. We didn't do anything, but the build process is successful. There's also no make and no make install, because it, again, it's just a binary. So we can override the do install. And this is not one off. So the example here, while it's trivial in that it's just a single binary, it's the same sort of work I'm doing every day with with plan development. Everyone's got their own build process. Everyone's got their own way of building software currently. And it's fully configurable and easy to change the way that it works from the default behavior. Um, so what we want to do here is once it's built, oh, sorry, once it's downloaded, we want to install the caddy binary uh, into the package prefix. And I also have uh, something that, let's just check our current directory. I'm going to copy some HTML file just so that we've got something to show once we do this. Um, so htdocs. Right, so in my directory here now, I now have an additional htdocs directory. Um, So when we do the install, one last step should be to copy across the htdocs. So I want to copy from my plan context directory, htdocs, into the package prefix. That's my plan. That's the custom steps. There's not much to it there. So we'll go back into the studio. <coughs> it's 
see, live coding with internet, no problems. Um, so this is actually completed the build, and it's generating the artifact. But if I try and run it, this is not going to work. So uh, what we've done here is it's, it's built, and I can grab the name of the build here. It's, uh, this is our artifact. I can try and load this service, have service load, and if we can watch the logs. All right, so the error here is loading caddy file, tries to open it, and there's no such file. We didn't create a caddy file. We didn't create a config file. All we've done is played with the plan file. So if I exit that studio and edit in config a caddy file, and if you haven't seen caddy, I think this will sell it to you. So we're just going to do a very, very basic config. Um, we're going to say the root of where we're serving files is going to be, and this is the habitat piece, uh, package path slash htdocs. And the other thing we're going to do is, I'm just going to hard code this for the moment. Uh, 2015 is the default port, but I'm just putting it here for example. So that's it. Seriously, um, that with, uh, if you add a, an email address, it'll do automatic SSL uh, generation for you and updates and yeah, super cool, super cool. Uh, so if we go back into our studio, How many times have I gone into the studio? Four. Four? I count seven. But I can't count, so that's all right. Um, but I guess the point there is like, it's a clean room environment, and I'm exiting and, and entering it over and over again. Um, I'm not worried about the state of that environment. Actually, the more I exit, the happier I, I am. And the builds that we're doing on core plans now, uh, we don't actually go into the studio. We're just running the build from outside the studio. Um, so now that we've run it, we can try and load this one. So there we go. Uh, started successfully running on port 2015. That seems correct. There's one more thing we need to do. We can't actually do that because it's inside a Docker container without uh, specifying some options when we load it. So the container is completely closed off. We need to open up some ports. Um, have docker ops equals, uh, so minus p2015. That's because I've got another one running. Nope. OK. So in here, if, uh, I, I've just gone into a clean studio, and I haven't built the software. I built it in the last studio. We've got this results directory with our build results, and we can just install it from this artifact. So if I grab this here, uh, results. then have service load rack ops caddy server. Okay, so it's running on 2015. I'm gonna switch back to the browser, which is that way, and go localhost 2015. That's it. So that was my first approach at My first exposure to plan building was to build something. I could have used a core plan here. I could have. Um, but to do it myself, package it myself, and, and run. And it's, it's very simple to do. Um, the next approach on from there, I can answer questions on this in a second, too, if people have questions. Um, let's switch back here. I am running out of time. The next approach on from there is to run a core plan. And this is the example I showed you before, like running Minio. Um, when getting started, running a core plan is often very attractive because it's super simple. All the software's there, it's all configurable, ready to go. But in reality, never, ever, ever run a core plan. Never. Unless you're hacking on it, right? Uh, if you're hacking on core plans, go for it. 
knock yourself out. Otherwise, use it as a dependency. Don't run it directly. Now, the reason for that is that the configuration is often not set up for it. In fact, the, the core plans that we maintain are designed to be simple. And if you take the, the Nginx configuration from any operating systems build, the configuration is super simple. It's not designed for you. You immediately go and change it. And that's what we want you to do with uh, core plans. Use it as a dependency. Take the binaries. Use the configuration as, as an example, but extend that. Extend the core plans. So this pattern of extending is what we call configuration plans. Um, or they sometimes are referred to as wrapper plans. Um, there's a couple of good posts around the place. Uh, my website and the forums have really good uh, examples. And Okay, I am running out of time, so I kind of want to wrap this up very quickly. The last point I guess I want to hit on is organizing your applications. Um, plan for expansion and know how big your service ring is going to be. If you look at HAB service load, this is the help for it. There's a whole bunch of stuff here that I never realized uh, until by accident one day I read the help. And what you'll normally see is um, if we quickly look at oh yep uh, just down the bottom left there you'll see caddy server dot default that's the uh, service name and the service group and that's what you see in most of the examples and most people will stop there. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other things you can do. And most importantly here is the application and environment flags. By default, they're not set. So when you load the service, this is the different ways it can look. When you load like this, core nginx, you'll get nginx.default, service name plus the service group. If you load the service and specify the group, you'll get something like nginx.app1. And that helps you start organizing your services in the ring, right? You can start targeting specific things. You can have multiple NGINXs running under different service groups. It's a good way to organize. But as it grows larger and larger, it can be difficult to separate these things out and you start getting funky names for services just so it fits in the space that you've got. But you can take advantage of these application and environment pieces to further break down your deployments and make them more addressable. Um, and I think this is one of the more important things that is, if it's documented, it's not documented well. Uh, if it is documented, I haven't read it. Um, the resulting service name from something like this, specifying application app one and environment staging is app one dot staging hash nginx, and in this example, data center one, which is a much more granular way of addressing something, particularly when you're doing service bindings between uh, Habitat services. All right, so it ends up something like this. So if you take away anything from this, there's a few golden rules I want you to think about. Never run core plans outside development, except, no exceptions. Never run it outside development. Use the configuration plan pattern. Use the core plans as dependencies. Wrap your own configuration around it. Don't run them directly. Use the application and environment pieces for larger deployments so that you can target individual services. Don't be afraid to fork a core plan. Um, grab me after this and I can show you some great examples of where I've taken core plans and kind of ripped them apart and done my own thing. But it's a great way to start out and it's a great way to get a more complicated plan going. And if you can, contribute back. It's a great community. There's a lot of core plans, but there's, we don't cover all the pieces of software we need. Um, we need more help all the time. Thank you very much. <laughs>